Greetings. Hello. Happy Sunday. Aquaba. We hope that you are well, reading, meeting your highest level of mental, physical, and spiritual strength and your greatest potential uh, to feel your absolute best today. And we thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Our Ancestors' Voices, a weekly program sponsored by the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And the topic today, the honest and complete legacy of Sekou Touré, very important topic, very important human being in Ahmed Sekou Touré. And so we're going to talk about him and his legacy. Certainly has had a, as much of an impact on my personal life as anyone, any other human being. So I'm honored to be able to uplift uh, his contribution to humanity today and we do so in honor of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, whose land this is and who we continue to support in their struggle for self-determination. And also with respect to our African ancestors who continue to encourage us to be strong and to continue to fight and to not be derailed by all of the confusion and nonsense out here that's designed to uh, prohibit us from reaching our full potential as human beings. So we're thankful for that. And we will start with our introduction as we do each week. And just to let you know, if you didn't know, and to remind you, if you forgot, Our Ancestors Voices is sponsored by the All African People's Revolutionary Party, the AAPRP, one of many programs that we do on a consistent basis in person and online. And the APRP is a revolutionary independent mass Pan-African political party based in Africa with an objective of Pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa. So that's what we're fighting for, one unified socialist Africa. We are convinced that this objective is the fulfillment of the needs of people of African descent everywhere on the planet Earth and is our best contribution to the worldwide movement for justice and forward human progress. And our work to achieve Pan-Africanism is detailed in Kwame Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, which calls for us to unite all of the revolutionary Pan-African formations who agree on the ground on the African continent that Pan-Africanism is one unified socialist Africa, because all kind of people mean all kind of things when they say Pan-Africanism. There's even a group I found out about recently called Pan-Africanists for Trump. So you have to understand what's meant when people say Pan-Africanism. And we would say that Pan-Africanism has to be anti-capitalist. It has to be pro-socialist. It has to prioritize Africa it can't just be some nebulous black people all over the world being united. That's not Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is centered around the unification and liberation of the African continent, not the Western hemisphere. So anybody saying any different, please send them to us so we can correct that confusion. Pan-African is for Trump. That's a damn shame. And Our Ancestors' Voices is hosted each week by AAPRP organizers Ajamu, myself, and Shakura, my biological and ideological daughter. And we are honored to have you with us for this very important topic on a very important human being, Ahmed Sekou Touré. Uh, he was not some nebulous Pan-Africanist. He was not some social media Pan-Africanist. He was one of the greatest African people to live in our human history. And so we're honored to speak of him today. And to get us started, I turn it over to Shakura. Greetings, greetings. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, comrade. So greetings, everyone. We hope you are well. I definitely want to start by reminding folks that the easiest way to remember this because this whole system is backwards. So the best way to think about, you know, how you can move forward in terms of understanding why you should be considering to learn more about Sekou Touré 
And if you have any hesitations, just think about it like this. When Malcolm X warned us, he was telling us in his own words that we needed to be aware that our enemies are posing as our friends. And you can think of examples such as the US military. You can think of examples such as police. And our friends sometimes are posing as the enemies. And sometimes that can be where they're making us think that they're trustworthy. And I was thinking of examples of Africans who, we just did this seminar a couple of weeks ago, Africans who are really interested in promoting this capitalist system. And in other words, they're really interested in being house slaves, however that fits for them. That's what they're interested in doing. And so we have these different situations where we need to be more aware. We need to pay more attention because the world that we live in makes it very clear that you should be respecting all kinds of people. You should be honoring them. You should be valuing them. And these are usually people who have committed rape or murder. These are usually people who have stolen land or in some cases, stolen people from land. And we can think of examples such as, you know, Jed Smith. We can think of Nathan Bedford Forrest. We can think of Kit Carson, right? We can think of Sutter. We can think of these different folks who have schools, community centers, statues around the world built in quote unquote honor of them because these are people who are really our enemies, but they're posing as our friends, right? And so then the objective becomes that if we don't know what's good for us, we should celebrate them because that's what it means to be patriotic is to celebrate these people. But in actuality, you're not stopping to think about how detrimental these folks have been for societies, for communities, for populations of people, how damaging they've been, how dangerous they were when they were moving through these spaces. And most of the people that I listed are deceased, but obviously we still have functioning folks in the US military. We still have functioning folks that are police officers. So even though the names that I listed are people who have already passed, we know that there are very, very much alive and well folks who are still promoting this ideology that they need to protect this capitalist system, that they need to protect America within a capitalist frame by any means necessary, right? And so then if we understand that, because we were listening to Malcolm and we understood what he was trying to get us to understand, then that means we should really pay close attention to today's seminar topic, especially because that means that if there are parks and community centers and statues built off of people who are posing as our friends and who really were our enemies and are our enemies, then that means that the opposite must also be true. That for people who we don't talk about because they're not celebrated, because they are considered to be enemies and they're really our friends, some of them may be still promoting capitalism, but Sekou Touré was not an example of that. Sekou Touré was definitely an example of someone who died fighting for what was right because he understood how important it was to stand up, not just for himself, because he understood that it wasn't just about him. See, hopefully we will start to pay attention to the fact that many people that we should be talking more about, many people that should have museums named after them, they should have statues built after them, they should have schools and parks and community centers built after them, we're thinking of Shirley Graham Du Bois, right? We're thinking of Emil Carr Cabral, right? We're thinking of Theodore Gomes, right? We're thinking of our comrade Carlotta, right? We're thinking of Sekou Touré. And of course, we're thinking of Kwame Touré as well as Kwame Nkrumah, right? So we're thinking of those folks. But sadly enough, many of us, without having a connection to an organization that's working for justice, and if we're not joining this seminar every weekend or any seminar for that matter, that is increasing our political education, then we really don't recognize those names when we hear them. If you're joining this seminar every weekend, then you should know those names like the back of your hand because we've talked in great detail about those folks. But if this is your first time joining us, welcome. But that's the point I'm precisely making is that you have yet to know what these folks have done. You have yet to know how their legacy has enhanced Pan-Africanism. And you certainly can't speak to the kind of work, organizing work that they have done 
to make the conditions for African people better. Some of that you should take responsibility for because you can still decide to join an organization that's working for justice. But some of that is not your fault. Some of that is by design because as we say at the bottom of the slide, if there was no media out of France, the US, et cetera, that respects the contributions of Sekou Touré, then that should tell you that you need to look closer. If they're not promoting what this person has done because he is considered a threat to capitalism thriving and surviving, then that should be enough of a clue for you to say, this is somebody I need to study more. Because if you yourself believe that capitalism is not a system that's worth fighting for, then you yourself should find other ancestors, may they rest in power, who have also taken on the same ideology so that they too could fight, so that they too could try to resist, so that they too could try to teach other people to resist, because that's our objective. That's what we're trying to do. And really what we're helping to get out is that we don't have to accept the conditions for what they are. So the opposite is true. If you're thinking of people who don't have parks and community centers and places named after them, that probably means they did something that was detrimental to the system managing itself. And that is why we should celebrate them. That is why we should promote them. That is why we should speak their name as loud as we can. We should tell as many people about what they have done. And most, most, most important, that is why we should try to research and learn as much as we can about them. We should find all the books that they wrote and read them. We should discuss those books with other people and say, did you know that Amilcar Cabral was known for this because of what they did? Did you know that people called him Che, but his full name was Ernesto Che Guevara and he grew up here and this is where he was born and this is what he did, not just for indigenous people, but for African people as well. Like that's how you start to have those conversations. And that's if you're not in an organization that's working for justice, if you are, then increasing your political education to create discussion questions based off of the readings that you all have done, right? Being able to discuss it with other folks who read the same exact thing as you so that you all can talk in more detail about that, right? So I think it's important to really think about that because that's all by design to teach us to celebrate those who don't deserve celebration and to be in disgust of the people who do deserve our celebrations to be in disgust when we think about Asada Shakur, to be in disgust when we think about Mumia Abu-Jamal, to think about all of these different folks who are political prisoners and how we probably can't name more than one person. But these folks have literally been incarcerated since before a lot of us were born because they decided to do what was right. And because of that, they've been behind bars for a majority of their adult life. And so these are just some different ways that we can think about that. And as I said, that's what should pique your interest. At this point, you know that this system is backwards. So if you know that people are not being celebrated, you should take it upon yourself to find out why. And in doing so, you'll probably learn that they had a lot to do with helping to advance the struggle for people everywhere. Next slide, please. We could also start to think about how I really just wanna highlight this photo, this image here, right? Like that's a powerful image, right? <laughs> like such a powerful image, right? We've got these four contenders here and they're all connected, excuse me, to the ammo, right? The bullets are connecting them and they intersect within that space. And so just highlighting how powerful this image is that we see, but also just thinking about how, you know, what happens when capitalism properly educated about anything African, well, we already know that because capitalism is focused on generating wealth, promoting wealth and protecting private corporations so that they can continue to make money off of money. We know that and we also understand what that prestige has done for other people who don't fit into that category, who don't fit into that formula, how that's impacted them as well. We think about how for capitalism to thrive, that meant that people had to lose their land meaning the indigenous people, but also other folks who were colonized, Asian descent folks, Irish descent folks. We also think about how people were killed in this process all around the world, how Africans were stolen from their land and many Africans were killed in the process on the way to the location that they would be dropped off on to become enslaved Africans, but also 
once they arrived, many Africans died on the plantation, right? And thinking about how all of this kind of factored into what free labor looks like, what exploitation would be defined as, as it would come to be, right? And then understanding how all of this took place at the expense of African people. And so, you know, it's not a surprise that we're not gonna learn about these same folks that, that I mentioned, these political prisoners, Kwame Ture, Kwame Nkrumah, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Carlotta. It's not surprising that we're not gonna learn about these folks because every single one of these folks made a decision to endanger the success of capitalism. And so therefore that's why they had to be removed. Even, even in quoting Malcolm X, Malcolm X was not one to be taken off that list. He was also on that list. That's why he had to go. And so to me, we know why capitalism is not teaching us the truth about anything related to Africa because A, they don't want you to know, meaning the people in power, they don't want you to know just how rich the continent is. If you really had any idea and you're an African person, then that would completely impact your self-esteem. And if you were denouncing your Africanness and you figured out just how wealthy that land is, you would be accepting the fact that you are African because you would be proud to know that so much comes from your land that provides for other people around the world to the point where people are literally dependent on the resources that you're providing. And so when we think more about that, that's a very prideful thing to think about. It's a very beautiful thing to think about how our people have resisted all these years. It's a beautiful thing to think about how we've continued to fight back. We never stopped fighting. We will continue to fight. We're fighting right now. Those are beautiful things, but at the same time, we can't expect the capitalist system that's exploiting us, our resources, our people, we can't expect them to honor us because that would be too much like right. And if they honored us, then that means they would lose the opportunity to profit off of our resources. They would lose the opportunity to profit off of us. They would lose the opportunity to manage what they have going on. They would lose the opportunity to depend on the diamonds. They wouldn't be able to get the cobalt anymore. That means Tesla would be out of business. They wouldn't be able to have the banks that are established because of how the resources are profited every month. If you have a profit that's coming in and you're expecting to sell that profit, then you can start to rely on that income. So if Africans had full control of Africa and if we shut down all neo-colonialists, imagine how powerful that would be because all these people who are depending on the copper and the cacao and the gold that comes from Africa, they would be SOL and their income would be damaged if not... Um, disintegrated and they'd have to figure out how are they going to now make up for these resources, right? So that's the beauty in us taking control of our land back. But we're going to first have to understand that we need to organize together to do that. And if we understand that we need to organize together, then we should also understand the importance of not relying on capitalism to teach us about ourselves, because that's a dream that's never going to happen. Like I said, if that were really the case, and capitalism would give up their biggest, would give up their biggest prize, would give up their biggest prize. I'm having some computer issues, so I hope you all are still with me, and I hope we're okay. I'm hearing doo doo and all these. Yeah. Things. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So just saying all of that. Thank you, comrades. Just saying all of that to say we have expectations of ourselves. We should at least, because we can't rely on a system that's already let us down. OK, and so in understanding that, you know, this is the time of year where family and other routines that are pushing for you to promote this country are going to start to really come in your face, especially with summer activities and whatnot. But this is also the time of year where you can still remember that your political education needs to be serviced. Your political education needs to be addressed. Your political education should still be enhanced. It's never too late for you to start doing your own research so that you can learn the truth. And the more educated you become, the more powerful you'll be because you'll start to connect dots and you'll start to understand how everything is connected because it's usually related to something else. You just may not have been able to put those two together. 
So with that, I close and I just encourage you all, A, to increase your political education, but remember, you shouldn't be doing that by yourself. You should join an organization that's working for justice and you should also find ways to discuss that with other folks so that they can organize with you as well. Obrigada. Uh, Asante Sana. Midasi, thank you. Shakura. And when we talk about Ahmed Secretary, you know, I, I mean, I joined the All African People's Revolutionary Party uh, literally weeks after Secretary Ray died in 1984. And so I didn't really know who he was. I mean, I always feel like it was the thoughts and the, the ideas of Malcolm X that brought me into this struggle. But as I began to participate in the APRP's work study process in 1984, I began to read more about the ideas of Kwame Nkrumah and Secretary Ray, Amilcar Cabral, and you know the others that Shakur mentioned, Shirley Graham, Du Bois, many of the giants of our history, Amy Jock Garvey. And as I read more about Secretary Ray, I got so much more interested <clears throat> because for myself, a major issue growing up the way I did in the community I did and in the surroundings I did was the question of dignity. Even though I didn't really understand what dignity was as a child, I, I always had a sense that we as a people needed to establish that we have a right to exist and we should be respected for our right to exist. And as I grew older, I understood that that's pretty much what dignity represents. And Secretary Ray talked and acted so much around the question of African people's dignity. I was just drawn to him once I joined the APRP work study process and began to study his work. And so for the last 40 years, I've made that a critical part of my own ideological development, studying, restudying, restudying, researching the ideas and practices of Ahmed Secretary. And so that's what I mean when I say he has had a tremendous impact on my personal development in this struggle for revolution, Pan-Africanism and forward progress. And so we wanna talk about what some of those things are that Secretary Ray contributed to us that uh, have impacted me and a whole lot of people. But I wanna, before we get into it, just say that it's always been interesting to me how particularly the white left, for example, um, white socialist organizations around the world, you know, have to some extent adopted Kwame Nkrumah, labeled him a Marxist Leninist and, you know, adopted him as someone that, you know, they accept on some level as being a revolutionary in the sense of, you know, how they define revolutionaries. And Amilcar Cabral certainly is in many circles of the white left has been adopted, you know, almost as a darling of the white left. Thomas Sankara, the same thing, a darling of the white left. But that never, that has never happened with Secretary Ray. And it, it always made me wonder why has that been the case? And some people, have argued over the years, well, it's because of language, you know, the Secretary spoke French and uh, Mandinka and, you know, these these folks don't know their language, but uh, I don't think too many more of them um, know uh, the languages that Thomas Sankara operated under, which French was obviously one of them, or Portuguese or Creole that Amil Cabral operated under. I, I, I think it's I've always felt like it's something much more complicated than that. And a lot of it, I think, is related to how people really see the world and how people see within the context of the world. In other words, there's a sense among the majority of Europeans in on the left 
that they are in the forefront of the ideological struggle um, for forward progress and socialism, particularly in the socialist movement, that they lead that movement. And Secretary Ray was someone who, you know, did not speak to uh, the conditions of Europe um, in the sense of, you, you know, connecting himself to the European struggle for forward progress. That, that's not what he did. He spoke specifically to the African reality. And, and I think that it was because of that primarily, and I'm not saying that I don't feel like Cabral or, or uh, Nkrumah or any others spoke anymore to um, anything other than the African reality. But I think that the way that Secretary did it was uh, perceived by a lot of people on the uh, in the white left as uh, dismissing them and their contributions. And we'll talk about some of that. Um, and, and it's it's really ironic because if you look at Secretary's keynote address at the sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania in 1974, um, his entire address attacked the concept of negritude which was basically the race-based consciousness for African people. And he talked about the necessity to have more of a class analysis in our perception of how we achieve Pan-Africanism. So it's ironic that I think he's suffered from this uh, perception that his analysis has been anti-white um, when clearly he uh, contributed so much to the class analysis or Pan-African revolutionaries. Um, and there are other things, but I think that, you know, it's just important that we lift up our own, we create our own people that we say are the contributors to our struggle for forward human progress. We decide that. We don't let anybody else do that for us. And without question, Ahmed Sekouture is one of those people that we lift up. No one else is doing it. Uh, no one else is going to do it, nor do we want or need anyone else to do it. So we're honored to have this opportunity to talk more about him today. And we start with just a brief history. Um, born as in the Mandinka ethnic group, um, Ture was actually the great grandson of Samori Ture. And Samori Ture is significant because in the 1800s, he established um, a Muslim dominated society all throughout West Africa. So Secretary came through that lineage, that strong lineage of struggle and, and, and an effort to, you know, build uh, society for our people. But what really I think is first worth noting about Secretary's political work was he was a postal worker in Guinea. He was not someone who went to college. He didn't have a college education. Um, he was a part of the service-based working class in Guinea. And he joined the Democratic Party of Guinea and the African Democratic Rally, um, which was an independent uh, Pan-African political party that was formed to bring independence to Guinea, inspired by uh, particularly the example of Ghana in 1957. Uh, many of the territories in Africa uh, accelerated their efforts to push towards independent uh, countries that did that, one of those areas that did that, and the Democratic Party of Guinea and the African Democratic Rally um, was uh, certainly an in entity that made that contribution. And the African Democratic Rally represents a number of these political formations in West Africa who wanted to work primarily saw their work as consistent and needing to be connected to one another, um, form these democratic rally. Uh, in Senegal and some other places. And so in 19... Uh, made a historic decision um, because of this push for independence from France, the former so-called Francophone African colonies. 
France panicking at the prospect of losing access to all of the wealth that it was stealing from Africa made the proposal to all of its then colonies that they become members of the uh, French Union, which is a union of countries affiliated with France. Economic, military, all of these types of uh, relationships. And all of the other countries at that time uh, in Africa who were affiliated with uh, France, colonized by France, not affiliated, colonized, like Senegal, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, Cameroons, Benin, etc. they all agreed to become a part of the French Union. Guinea and the Democratic Party of Guinea, the PDG, on the other hand, gave a resounding no. We don't want to be a part of the French Union. And Secretary summarized their position when he said that we prefer free chains to poverty and riches. In other words, they felt consistently from every person, uh, the overwhelming majority of people in Guinea, that they wanted to forge their way on their own and completely split from their European masters. And so that's the decision they made. And on October 2nd, 1958, Guinea became independent. But the but France, again, extremely irritated, upset, angry, frustrated at the prospect of an African country decided that, deciding that they didn't want to be a slave nation to Europe anymore, uh, left France and left in a way that made it uh, very difficult for Guinea to uh, establish its footing uh, as an independent nation. And what I mean by that is the, the white people from, from France in Guinea didn't just leave Guinea in, in, in October of 1958. They took everything. They took all of the infrastructure with them. They took, they uh, demolished the plumbing throughout the country of Guinea. They demolished the electrical sockets throughout the country of Guinea. They destroyed everything like the primitive savages that they are. And, and these people have the audacity to call us thugs and savages. And a lot of our people regurgitate and call our people the same things. And that's because we don't know our history. You know, this, this is a, this, what the French did in Guinea is an unquestionable act of savagery. They took everything and completely sabotaged the country as punishment for African people saying, we don't want to be your slaves anymore. And so Guinea, undeterred, said that we're going to continue to build our revolution in Guinea, and we're going to continue to do it even though we don't have a dime to do it with. And that's significant, you all, because Guinea went about doing that with the PDG by developing a revolutionary structure in Guinea, uh, similar to what Cuba, Socialist Cuba did with the Committees for Defense of the Revolution, the CDRs, Guinea established the uh, Local Revolutionary Authorities, or PRLs, as they were called, under the PDG. And what these PRLs did is they served, like the CDRs in Cuba, as the community's resource to engage and have a voice in the national government. So each of these communities, like communities in Conakry or in Farina and all of the areas in Guinea, they had these PRLs. And the PRLs spoke to the needs of the local people in those areas. And they had budgets. And they had people that represented them. And they took those to the national level of the PDG. And that's how they were able to administer their government. And this implementation of democracy in Guinea was extremely popular. You can go on YouTube and you can pull up a type in Secretary and you can pull up videos of him driving in the streets of Conakry, driving his own car and just driving on the street and getting out and greeting people, talking to people, no bodyguards, no military, no nothing. And this spoke to the popularity of the PDG and Secretary 
in Guinea. And this is important because the capitalist media will have you convinced. They'll tell you he was a dictator and he was brutally repressive towards the people. And we'll address some of that nonsense. But we're making the point that Guinea and the PDG were building revolution in Guinea. And they were doing that on a platform of dignity as African people. We don't have much, but we have dignity. But they also recognized that they had, they did have a number of natural resources. Even to this day, a large percentage of the bauxite in the world, about 60% of the bauxite products that are used in the United Snakes of America come from Guinea bauxite. And bauxite is the natural mineral that you use to make aluminum products. So if you have aluminum wheels on your car, they more than likely came from bauxite in Guinea. If you wrapped your food in aluminum foil, it more than likely comes from bauxite from Guinea. But they did not, the PDG Secretary, they did not want to uh, give in to the multinational corporations who had, up until independence, viciously exploited the bauxite. Companies like Kaiser Aluminum and Alcoa uh, Aluminum. And so they wanted to develop a plan and a strategy to use the bauxite to be a resource to build up the infrastructure of Guinea. And so in 1959, when PDG to the U.S. to meet with uh, then President Dwight Eisenhower and all those crackers, the, the crackers wrote that they were utterly amazed at the delegation from Guinea because even a simple question like, well, where are we going to go to have lunch? The Guinea delegation of the PDG, every member, I think there were about 25 of them, had to have a say-so in where they were going to go eat. You all, thank you so much for your patience. Have to have a awesome. Sorry about that, Daddy. It was cutting out a little bit. All right. Well, thank you all so much. So I know Comrade Ajamu is working on getting back in here as soon as possible. Oh, I see him now. Okay, I'm going to give you control again. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. So some problems with capitalism. All right. So we'll try to keep it going here. So um, I don't know what you last heard, but I was just making the point that uh, the, the Democratic Party of Guinea displayed a level of democracy in their first trip to the U.S. that, you know, these these clowns and thieves here couldn't understand. And it, it really set the stage because at one point they had a state level meeting and the secretaries for the, the U.S. government were trying to shove this aid package down the throats of the Democratic Party of Guinea, because that was all they understood is that we got to get these people on our side in this Cold War, this war between the US and the Soviet Union. We got to keep these people from going to the Soviet Union side. That was all, that was the only thing they could understand. To them, we were just proxies. Africa was just a proxy in their fight with the Soviet Union. And so they went to the PDG delegation during this visit and they, said, well, we have this aid package. And Secretary, after consulting with the PDG delegation, made a statement and he told them, we don't want your aid. We didn't come here for aid. We came here for respect. And this is the overwhelming and reoccurring theme of the PDG and Secretary. And immediately at that point, they had followed up because they had made a request that they wanted to tour the U.S. South. And the U.S. government hadn't responded to that because the last thing they wanted 
were African diplomats going into the South and seeing racist Jim Crow segregation in effect. But Secretary knew the political situation here. He knew uh, how white supremacy operated in the United States. And that's why he wanted to do the tour. And they went on the tour. They went to Alabama, Mississippi, I believe Louisiana, and they observed the conditions of our people. And that really served to increase the consciousness of the PDG militants who were Pan-Africanists, right? They understood that these people they saw suffering in the U.S. South were their people. And this experience helped them understand how they needed to relate to the African struggle, you know, outside of Guinea. And so the point of this is that, you know, the PDG was really focused on building its political foundation in Guinea as a revolutionary socialist party. That's what their focus was. And there are a lot of things happening that Secretary Ray played a major role in uh, helping initiate. Um, we talk about uh, many of those things um, in the time that we have here. Uh, Ture was a willing participate in Kwame Nkrumah's uh, initiation to create a Pan-African Union that existed with Ghana at the time, with Guinea, and with Mabido Kuta, Kita of Mali, where they formed a union. And they were trying to get other countries to form the union. Some of them because of you know whatever their political pressures they were under, like Gamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt were hesitant to join. But that's exactly what we needed. And that union played a critical role in when the crisis in the Congo, again, these capitalists uh, were trying to get that uranium in the Congo so they could build atomic weapons to compete against the Soviet Union. And so here comes Patrice Lumumba and the National Congolese Movement, and they were trying to nationalize the resources and use them for the Congolese people and for African people. And the capitalists, they can't have that. They got it. These resources have to be for their disposal, for their profit, for their usage only, not for the people where the resources come from. So this is why they sabotaged the government of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. And we've talked about that. We have a whole um, workshop on that if you go back and look at the videos. But the point for today is that uh, Ture sent his troops to the Congo under the auspices of the United Nations. And, and when that came to a point where it was clear that the United Nations strategy was not going to work in terms of supporting the legitimate government of Patrice Lumumba and the National Congolese Movement, those Guinean troops, along with the Ghanaian troops, uh, took action on their own to protect Lumumba. And, and I've argued this before. Uh, I don't think there's any way Patrice Lumumba would have lived as long as he did, were it not for the Ghanaian and the Guinean troops who were in the Congo. And there was also uh, to raise in the PDG's support for Amilcar Cabral and the African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau, the PAIGC's anti-colonial war against Portugal. And that was manifested in the fact that Ture offered the PAIGC the opportunity to stage its military operations in Guinea. And if you look at a map, you know that Guinea is bordered um, with Guinea-Bissau. So that was a very strategic advantage for the PAIGC. And for that 20-year uh, period, the PAIGC waged much of that war from Guinea. And this would have, it would have been much more difficult for the PAIGC to be successful in running the Portuguese out of Guinea-Bissau had it not been for the support of the Democratic Party of Guinea and Secretary. And this is manifested by, if you go to Guinea-Bissau, there are monuments to Secretary and the PDG all over PAIGC headquarters and all over Guinea-Bissau um, because they recognize the Pan-African solidarity, the Pan-African unity, rather, that Secretary exhibited in his willingness to thumb his nose at the imperialists and permit the PAIGC to wage its operations from Guinea soil. 
And this was, again, a critical part of it. And then we have to talk about Secretary Ray's uh, role. We talked about how he saw the conditions of African people in the United States. And so this led to a few years later, in 1964, the PDG and Secretary Ray sponsored a uh, delegation of members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, one of the chief civil rights movements here in the United States, to come to Guinea and to spend time with the Democratic Party of Guinea, to observe the cadre building process of the PRLs in Guinea, and to understand the work that the PDG was doing creating a society where healthcare was free, where education was free. In one of the poorest countries in the world, they were doing that. Um, understanding the upliftment of women under the PDG in Guinea. And they wanted SNCC to see that, to serve as an inspiration for the work SNCC was doing in this backward country. And so people like John Lewis and Miss Fannie Lou Hamer and Ruby Doris Robinson Smith, and you know John Lewis, you know, he was a longtime congressperson, but he talked about in his own autobiography how inspired he was to do the work after he visited Guinea and was hosted by the Democratic Party of Guinea. Cleve Sellers was a part of the stick uh, delegation. And his son is on CNN today, Bakari Sellers. He's on there all the time. And Cleve Sellers talked about the influence that Guinea had on his consciousness. Miss Fannie Lou Hamer came back and told Kwame Ture, who was Stokely Carmichael then, that they walk just like us, Stokely. They carry their babies like us. They just like us. And Miss Hamer never stopped talking till she died in 1977. This is a woman from rural Mississippi who was disrespected her entire life just for fighting for her own dignity in the country where she was born and went to Guinea and sat at a table with the president of the country, Secretary Ray, and he talked to her about how important she was and how honored he was to have her in Guinea and how she could stay there if she wanted to. And this woman came back and she never, the remaining 13, the remaining, um, 13 years that she lived, she never stopped talking about what impact that had on her and how she never had any experience close to that in this country. So don't come to us talking to us or oh, the people in Africa, they never did. Now shut your goddamn mouth. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. We have a rich history of Pan-African unity and support for our struggles all over the world. And these Negroes vomiting out this nonsense you're not even, at least have, make sure the capitalists pay you to spread disinformation. You're not even getting paid. You're just uh, talking nonsense freely. It should be a crime, you all. It really should. I mean, this is a major contribution to our struggle. Everybody in SNCC talked about how it inspired them. That's why Harry Belafonte helped arrange the delegation trip because the SNCC organizers were being demoralized at the constant violence they were facing and the lack of support they were getting in this country for putting their lives on the line for justice. And then they go to Guinea and their spirits are revitalized when they see African people running a society with dignity. We try to tell you all, all the time, you will never understand who we are as a people if you just stay in this backward ass country. You have got to go home to Africa, you have got to understand that we are so much more than these dumbass celebrities and what you see in this society, these dumbass politicians. We are so much more than that. And this is what Secretary Ray and the PDG wanted to share with our youth in the civil rights movement here. And they did that. But he didn't stop there. He is a co founder of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. There's no question about that because the AAPRP was founded in Guinea in 1968. It was Seka Ture and the PDG who invited Kwame Nkrumah to Guinea when the CIA, the criminals in action, 
overthrew his Nkrumah's government in Ghana. You see the pictures of Secretary with Kwame Nkrumah, Secretary with Amilcar Cabral, Secretary with Fidel Castro, Secretary here in the U.S., Secretary with Nkrumah and Kita signing the Pan-African Union. And so it was uh, Ture that invited Nkrumah to come to Guinea and become co-president of Guinea. That was a major gesture in 1966 because it sent the message that you can remove Nkrumah from Ghana, but you cannot remove Nkrumah from the hearts and minds of the African masses. And that was a critical uh, adrenaline lift for African people all over the planet Earth because Kwame Nkrumah was seen then as he's seen now, rightfully so, as the father of Pan-Africanism. And so this was a extreme act of lack of ego on the part of Secretary to say, come to our country and become president. And Kwame Nkrumah said, I can't be president. The people voted for you. This man was willing to step down. When have you ever seen that in human history? For, for his big brother that he respected. And so he said, well, we'll make you co-president and we'll do that. And so he invited Nkrumah there to Guinea. He invited the young Stokely Carmichael to come to Guinea and live there and become a political secretary to Kwame Nkrumah and become a militant within the Democratic Party of Guinea. He invited Amilcar Cabral, we already talked about that, to stage and build the PAIGC in Guinea. And it was there that those three individuals, along with a young African from Gambia who walked from Gambia to Guinea, look at the map and see that that's about a thousand miles, walked all the way so that he could work with Kwame Nkrumah and Secretary Ray and Amilcar Cabral and the then Stokely Carmichael. And those four, and then eventually other people, formed the first work-study circle for the All-African People's Revolutionary Party in 1968, based on the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. So I have to say Secretary Ray is a... I don't, I don't go to a single work-study meeting without thinking about Secretary Ray because I don't even think we would be here in the manifestation that we are without his contribution. Without his contribution. And we don't even have time to get deep into Secretary Ray inviting Malcolm X when Malcolm X went to Africa to meet with him. And Malcolm X wrote in his, in, in his, his notes, in his autobiography, how Secretary Ray told him, you are fighting for our people's dignity. This is what we need. And don't give in on that. And how inspired Malcolm said he was by the leadership that he saw in Secretary Ray and the message that he gave him. And so this is the Secretary Ray that we want to talk about. And so what our enemies will do, because, you know, like Secretary Ray himself said, if the enemy's not doing anything against you, it's because you're not doing anything. So imperialism constantly comes after the legacy of Secretary Ray. They want to talk about Camp Boreal and call Secretary Ray a dictator. Camp Boreal was a, a facility um, in Guinea, Conakry, where prisoners were placed. And a lot of the people placed there were people who were trying to overthrow the PDG. And there were people there that were tortured. There were people there that were killed. That did happen. But that has to be evaluated within the context of what was happening in Guinea. All of these things I've talked about put Guinea in a position where they were tar targeted by the Central Intelligence Agency. They were targeted by U.S. imperialism, by French imperialism, British imperialism, Zionist Israel. They were targeted by all these countries. And the, the documentation is everywhere. They talked about Ghana, like Nkrumah might, we might have had a chance with him, but Secretary, it wasn't, it wasn't even worth their time they considered to even try to negotiate with him. He was a, a, a not someone that was going to listen to imperialism. That's how they framed him. And so they were nonstop attacks against Guinea, against the PDG. 
And so this kind of, yeah, Kwame Nkrumah talked about it in his, the letters book, Letters from Conakry. When Nkrumah lived there, he talked about the sense of siege in Guinea and how people didn't know who to trust. So yeah, they were, they were without question mistakes. But the way these people want to lift up Camp Boreal, the regime that imperialism supported that overthrew the PDG in 1984 after Secretary's death, uh, Lasana Conti, they had, compared to the, the torture and death that they carried out in Camp Boreal, it, it made what happened during the 26 years of the PDG and Secretary look like, like it never happened. And that's not to diminish it, but it's it's saying that, you know, first, there's always going to be this struggle when your country is constantly under attack. And that's going to, that that reality is going to play a role in the stability of your country. And, and imperialism knows that. That's why they do that. That's why they put sanctions on these countries. That's why they have a 62-year blockade against Cuba. They want to make the country implode from within. That's their strategy. So you can't just look at Camp Boreo and blame Secretary Ray. That's not a complete, thorough, and legitimate analysis. That's all we're saying about that. Because there's no one thing that cannot be refuted. You can't tell me that any country can exist for 26 years like the PDG did in Guinea, like the Cuban Revolution has existed. No movement can last that long when it's opposed by imperialism, when it's sabotaged consistently by imperialism. There's no way it can last that long without the popular support of the masses of the people. So this is why we know that the, the people in Guinea still support the PDG. The PDG is still extremely active. Uh, the APRP and the PDG are one, like the APRP and the PAIGC are one, the PAIGC and the PDG are one, the PAC and the APRP and all these parties are one. We're one entity. That's the work that we're doing. And the PDG is extremely active. Uh, they just had a major Pan-African conference there just two months ago. And still working in the ideas and practices of Ahmed Secretary. So we know that Secretary died in March 26, 1984, but his legacy lives forward in all of us. Like Fred Hampton said, you can kill the revolutionary, you cannot kill the revolution. So all they have done with their sabotage of Guinea is create millions of Secretaries. So we want to thank you for joining us. We invite you back next week, April 21st. We'll be talking about when Cuba's Fidel Castro came to Harlem in 1960. A very interesting story. If you don't know it, you want to join us. Very important history. Uh, Malcolm X had a meeting when that happened in Harlem at the Hotel Teresa with Fidel Castro. And we'll be talking about all of the dynamics that contributed to that. We want to invite you to the upper left-hand corner, the QR code. We have uh, access for you for all of the APRP programs that happen um, when they happen. So we want you to support all of them and please tell people about them. Um, the Forward Ever Shop, please purchase from them and tell people about them. Uh, Hood Communists, please support Hood Communists. Uh, Revolutionary African Blog, a better world me you can get these videos join the all african people's revolutionary party go to aprp-intl.org support burkina books the lower right hand qr code tell people about these things please you all please tell people uh, my book a guide for organizing defense against white supremacist patriarchal and fascist violence had a very uh successful uh, weekend, last weekend, out of town, out of state, engaging in anti-fascist work. I fund that work um, through the proceeds I get from this book. I went out of town yesterday to do some more of that work, going out of town again this next week. So please buy the book, tell other people about it, do what you can to support, be strong, don't give up, don't be discouraged, don't let these people tell you 
anything. Understand that victory is on the horizon. Join an organization for whatever. Backwards never.